So a little introduction. Paul Kelly is an award-winning architectural illustrator living and working in Delaware, Ohio. His work is inspired by a life lived in rural and urban contexts with a bit of travel thrown in as well. The tension between built and natural, urban and rural, is something that stirs his heart as he seeks to highlight the beauty that, bu that binds it all together. Side note, he also happens to have over 99,000 followers on Instagram. So maybe a few more likes uh, and follows, we can push him over that 100,000 mark. Uh, hint, hint. So I uh, just wanted to welcome my friend, Paul Kelly. Yeah, of course. Let me, I'm going to just take a moment to switch you over here. Success. All right. Thank you, Jeremy. Yeah. All right. Um, thank you for coming tonight. And, you know, candidly, I'm a lot more comfortable making art than I am talking about making art. So thank you for your patience and grace as we dive in here, and I'll probably reiterate a few things that Jeremy just said, but um, yeah, my name is Paul. I'm an artist and designer living and working in central Ohio right here, and I've titled this talk uh, Sketch Inspired, and sketching, urban sketching, or another term I like to use as rural sketching is my current mode of operation as an artist, and highlighting the beauty of built and natural forms and sketching in both urban and rural settings is one of my biggest passions and most days it brings me a lot of joy. And finding joy, inspiration and motivation in the creative process and making personal artwork has been top of mind for me here in, in recent years. And I've gone through some seasons where joy and inspiration, motivation, they're all very present as I create and other seasons where I'm staring at a blank piece of paper or I struggle to open up my sketchbook. And this evening I'd like to share some of those struggles and successes making personal artwork uh, in the hopes that what I share uh, might help some other creatives avoid a few pitfalls, but also encourage us all to seek joy and inspiration in what we make. So I'll start us off with a few items that I can honestly say were pivotal in helping me discover joy uh, in making artwork as a very young artist. The first one is a thermometer, and the second one is Bob Ross. And I think most of you are familiar with both of these, but for anyone who is unfamiliar, Bob Ross was an American painter, art instructor, and television host of a show titled The Joy of Painting from 1983 to 1994 on PBS. And if you aren't sure what a thermometer is, you can come talk to me after. Um, but I'm referring to a day that I was kept home from school sick, and it was the best kind of sickness to have when you're a kid. Um, I had a temperature that tipped the thermometer, you know, tipped the scale and said I needed to stay home. But other than that, I really felt okay, and so that meant I had the day off of school. And on sick days, my mom, who's sitting right here, thank you, mom, would encourage me to do things like read or rest or be low-key and heal up. Uh, no riding my bike or playing video games. Um, I could have fun, but not too much fun. And that morning, I chose to do one of my favorite low-key activities, uh, which was practice drawing. And I had recently been given a book, um, I think by my grandparents, titled, uh, it was just simply titled, How to Draw. And it showed me step-by-step -step instructions on how to draw things like, you know, horses, people, cars, houses, et cetera. And when lunchtime came around, you know, mom was okay with me popping on the TV. And after The Price is Right had reached its conclusion, I knew what channel to turn to, which was PBS and The Joy of Painting. So for the next 30 minutes, Bob Ross would go on to magically create this nature scape painting seemingly out of nowhere, leaving me and the rest of his audience just dumbfounded, thinking, how did he just do that? And all the while, he would speak to his audience in a way that was so encouraging and helpful, calming and full of grace. And he'd use phrases like, there are no mistakes, only happy accidents. Find freedom on this canvas, believe that you can do it, and my personal favorite is, let's get crazy. So watching that show, it truly made me believe that I could be an artist and that making art should be a joyful and wonder-filled experience. And I'd go on through that day knocking out drawing after drawing 
And even though my drawings didn't look like Bob Ross's, you know, like most kids, I kept making art because it was fun and I indeed found joy in the process. So another influence I'd like to share with you is an artist named Jan Korthals. He was a Dutch artist in the mid 20th century and Jan worked in a variety of mediums and these are sketches of his using ink and watercolor. And these two exact prints hung in my grandmother's living room for over 50 or 60 years. Is that right, Dad? Yeah. Um, they were cherished by my grandma and always placed prominently in her home. And I saw these every time we would go and visit grandma. And the sketches made just a huge impression on me as, as a kid. The architecture that's represented and Jan Korthal's drawing style were like nothing I had seen before. And the expressive lines and beautiful European scenes filled me with wonder and made me curious. And my grandma Kelly, she liked to travel when she could and she always had a style and grace about her that these prints seemed to exemplify. And the two prints now hang in my studio as an influence and an encouragement and a wonderful memory of my grandma Kelly. Uh, she was one of my biggest encouragers as I grew and made art throughout my childhood. And it was the same with my grandma and grandpa Staley on my mom's side. Um, they owned and operated a dairy and crop farm about 20 minutes from where we lived in rural Ohio. And I visited often and I fell in love with just the rhythms of agriculture and nature and the buildings and machines that served in farm life. And my grandma and grandpa were artists in their own right making crafts and woodworking in their spare time. And watching them make things with this joyful contentment that they had, along with their passion for farming and country life, it just made a huge impact on me. And I was so blessed to have these influences, along with my parents and my family and friends that encouraged me and filled my life with joy. Uh, so I would go on to make art through my childhood and I loved every minute that I had to draw make things with my hands and I've been, you know, I didn't realize it back then, but holding on to that same joy while making art would prove more difficult as I entered adulthood. So that's a glimpse of where my journey with art uh, and making art began and moving on to present day. I have a small business, Kelly Design Company, and I specialize in architectural visualization and 3D modeling. Essentially, I work with architects, planners, and developers to produce graphics and renderings that help visualize building projects. And I've got some examples of recent work. Um, so this is a rendering, you know, speaking of PBS, this is a rendering I just did for uh, the new WOSU headquarters. Uh, it's gonna be located just off of High Street uh, near Ohio State's campus. And this is an interior shot. They have this nice big wall that can open up. It kind of reminds me of this space, honestly. Um, but looking into that, they can kind of bring the outside in and the inside out. It should be a pretty fun space. Um, this is a recent rendering from Bridge Park in Dublin, Ohio. Uh, we had our sketch crawl there last month. So anyone that was able to join us, I appreciate you guys coming out. We had a good time. Um, this is the new Hocking Hill State Park Lodge, um, and the old lodge, I think about four years ago, burnt down, unfortunately. So they're rebuilding it, and it's redesigned, and it's going to be, I think, pretty spectacular. I can't wait to visit there when it's built. This is the new innovation campus uh, that's going to be uh, west of, um, well, it's Ohio State's campus, but it's on the west side. So I think that's Ackerman Road for anybody that lives here locally, um, but it's gonna be a, a pretty exciting development. This is the Connor School in Dayton, Ohio. And I love this building. This is a K through 12 school and they're building instead of out, they're building up, which I think is really neat. I think it's four or five stories tall. Uh, so that's gonna be a new school in Dayton. And then this is uh, fairly recently released in Scioto Peninsula the second phase of construction there. And if these buildings are built as I show them, they'll probably be some of the largest buildings built in Columbus uh, in quite some time. I don't know exactly how they're gonna top out compared to some of the, the other buildings you see in the background, but um, it's, it's a fun project. So being, oops, 
So early on in my career, I would have done all of this work by hand. For about t a 10 year period, the computer had minimal involvement in my process. I would use watercolor, color pencils, and, and markers to produce these architectural renderings. However, the work that I just showed you and my current production methods, they're entirely digital. As you can imagine, large scale projects like these, they require a great deal of accuracy and patience to produce. And unfortunately, phrases like, uh, there are no mistakes or happy accidents or let's get crazy, they don't jive well with client expectations and deadlines. So the move from hand rendering to digital rendering has been a necessity. Uh, the digital age and a fast moving economy make speed, flexibility and accuracy a big priority. Being able to dive into the smallest details and iterate or adjust as only digital allows me to do has really been helpful to the process in bringing design ideas like this to life. So I absolutely find this kind of work interesting and rewarding and it's helped provide for my family, it's educated me, expanded my knowledge of architecture, and it's introduced me to some really interesting people and places. However, there are certainly those times just during the ups and downs of, of life and a commercial art career that I've struggled to maintain a connection to the joy of making art and finding inspiration or feeling motivated, specifically when I sit down to make personal artwork just for myself. So as an example, many years ago, I decided I would make a painting that my wife and I could hang above our fireplace in our home. And I knew my wife loved Italy, and my wife's here tonight, and uh, we, we hope to visit there someday. So I figured this should be a piece of cake. I'm a commercial artist. I work with architecture all the time. Um, you know, I'll just paint an, Ita an Italian street scene, tile roofs, balconies, people wandering in the alley. And when it came time to paint, I found myself in that moment again, you know, staring at a blank piece of watercolor paper for quite a while, and I sort of froze. And it wasn't a birthday gift or anything like that. There wasn't any pressure to it. I just wanted to paint something for myself. But it was hard, and you know, I couldn't figure out why. And I had painted, you know, painted so many renderings by hand for client work. But rather than feel inspiration or joy in that moment, creating something for myself, it felt, felt forced and contrived. I was able to push forward and make something, but it felt off and I couldn't quite pinpoint why. And I thought maybe this is a case of, I'm just being my own worst critic. Um, yeah, I wanted to put my best foot forward in the effort. So I had the painting framed and a nice thick frame to help compensate for my lack of confidence in what I just made. And I hung it above the fireplace and uh, the moment had come for the reveal and we stood and admired it for a bit. And my wife's reaction was encouraging, but it held some truth as well. And after a few moments and some kind comments like, looks good or wow, a, a little bit you know, of a but followed. And she said, but I think it kind of looks like something you would make for work. And I realized instantly that her comment was spot on and I was not offended. I was not offended. <laughs> the artwork I had made looked exactly like a commercial rendering for a new Italian development project. I didn't see any of myself or much expression in that painting. So after some reflection and a trip to Hobby Lobby to purchase a real painting to hang above our mantle, uh, it dawned on me that one, I had never actually been to Italy. I didn't have any connection or concept of what it felt like to be in that Italian alleyway. That wasn't part of my experience and inspiration was lacking. And then two, you know, I'll call it muscle memory. My style had been so influenced by the goals and needs of commercial projects. From 2005 to 2014, I had created over 750 hand-drawn commercial renderings. I almost can't believe that when I read it, but that's true. When I sat down and I tried to make artwork for myself, my well-established process took over like an autopilot and it still felt like I was working for someone else. So it was around this time that the digital process had really started to take hold in the architectural visualization industry. And I mentioned earlier, the switch from hand rendering to digital was out of necessity, and it was. But in addition, after making so many hand-drawn renderings, I was feeling burnout and I welcomed the move to digital. 
My experience with hand rendering translated well to digital. The concepts of color, composition, architectural detailing, they were all carried over into my new digital process. But I put my art supplies in drawers and I seldom made anything by hand for about two years. I didn't make anything by hand. I think I needed that break and stepping away from that allowed me to reset uh, my art process both physically and mentally. So in 2016, I had the opportunity or we had the opportunity to take a trip to Italy. Uh, my wife and I were beyond excited for the trip and after a two year hiatus from drawing by hand, I started to miss my art supplies and it was a couple's trip. It was just Kristen and I and no kids, although we love traveling with my kids. My daughter's here as well. I love traveling with you. But knowing I would get to make uh, or get to take my time and feel what it was like to walk in those Italian alleyways, make memories with Kristen, and truly absorb and experience the architecture firsthand, I couldn't pass up the opportunity to bring some art supplies. I was excited to see if I could rediscover some of that joy and inspiration that had gone dormant. But this time, I wasn't focused on making a master artwork to hang above our fireplace. I just wanted to have fun. And that is not a toupee, that is my real hair. Um, time flies by. Um, I had been playing around with a trend that I saw online and on social media, something called urban sketching. And urban sketchers essentially are people that carry sketchbooks with them and study their environment by making quicker sketches and notes that document their observations. Typically, urban sketchers use pen and watercolor to sketch with, and I think that's because pen and watercolor, they're so accessible, they're very portable, um, you can travel with them easily, and they clean up easily. And pen and watercolor were tools that I already had loads of experience with. And I was intrigued, and I brought along a travel watercolor set, a sketchbook, and I splurged a bit and bought my first fountain pen to sketch with before we left for Italy. So the trip experience, it beat our expectations. My wife and I had an amazing time. And indeed, we were able to leisurely make our way through places like Venice and Cinque Terre. Uh, we even got to enjoy several uh, long train rides through the Italian countryside. And I had opportunities to sketch live and in person, and I loved it. And I was a little rusty, but something had clicked. I could feel that inspiration and joy were present again as I was sketching there. And when we came home from the trip, I wanted to continue on making sketches. I wasn't in Italy anymore. You know, now I'm in Ohio, which is quite different from Italy. Uh, however, I had learned that, that on that trip that in-person connection and getting to see and experience a place was where I would find my inspiration and joy as an artist. So going forward, I would bring my sketching supplies and camera as we traveled to places like New York City. Uh, New Orleans. Savannah, Georgia. and Chicago. And when I was at home in central Ohio, my sketchbook, it was always with me in my bag from that point forward. I kept an eye out for inspiring places or moments to sketch. And central Ohio has always been home for me. My life in Ohio has been spent in both urban and rural contexts, and I find amazing amounts of beauty in both settings. Um, so this is Ohio Westlands campus, um, the Richard Ross uh, gallery there on Sandusky Street. This is from Hocking Hills. This is in rural uh, Northeast Ohio. This is Delaware State Park. And this is also in Delaware, close to where our home is in downtown Delaware. It's a, an old um, grain elevator, and I'm just captivated by it. Uh, I love drawing there. And compared to commercial projects that have yet to be built, sketching on site from 
you know, photos that I've made or actually sketching on site, it allows me to study and highlight the beauty that currently exists all around me. I love to focus on themes like history, hard work, the beauty and texture of older buildings, and the blend of God's creation with human ingenuity. So I finally felt like I had found a big piece to the puzzle in finding inspiration through authentic experience and in-person connection. And re-engaging this side of my craft was really exciting and rewarding. And I began to post my sketches on social media and I made immediate connections with a new audience and fellow artists. However, coming off the high of a trip to Italy and settling back into the routines and rhythms of life, I had gently been lulled back into inconsistency and struggling to find time to sketch. Uh, between the priorities of family and friends and work and church, which are all great things, it's been challenging to find that personal time and feel motivated to make artwork for myself. And even if I do make the time, I find myself asking the question, will inspiration and joy be there alongside me as I create? And unfortunately, the answer isn't always yes. When I'm working on personal projects and artwork, I become my own boss. The pace, the production, the amount of effort, they're all dictated by me. There is no client to answer to. And it seems like these should be moments where joy and inspiration flourish. However, I have some additional you know, struggles that can quickly sabotage one of my personal art sessions. And these struggles, they're sly and they show up in subtle forms. They're like an undercurrent or a running loop in my subconscious. And the first one uh, that I struggle with is anxiety and worry. I do struggle a little bit with anxiety. And when I'm feeling anxious, it's like a cloud that follows me around and seems to affect everything, including the time that I dedicate to making artwork. And I want to be in control and I want to be comfortable. But getting out of my studio and into the world to go explore and travel, study and sketch, it means I'm not always in control or comfortable. The time involved, the weather, the traffic, uh, interactions with people, it all provides some amount of uncertainty and sometimes discomfort. Perfectionism and analysis paralysis. Um, I want to qualify that pursuing excellence in what we do is a good and worthy thing, and we're called by God to do so. However, allowing perfection to get in the way of progress is something that I have struggled with. I want to see how it ends before I get started. When I struggle with analysis paralysis, I'll spin my wheels and think or spend a lot of time thinking about making art and very little time actually making art. I want it to be perfect. And if something is perfect, there's no reason to be anxious or worried or scared. If I post something perfect on social media, it's bound to get tons of likes and follows, which isn't always the case, by the way but I can get stuck thinking about what others want to see rather than what I want to make. And the last one is ambition and apathy. Ambition says I wanna have and make it all now. And when I'm in this mode trying to make art, I struggle to trust in the creative process and I become impatient. And I start aiming for that masterwork that I can hang above the fireplace and I stop being content with the time that I've carved out to sketch in my more humble sized sketchbook. And apathy says, if I can't reach the desired result quickly, then why bother, or why bother? Maybe it's a waste of my time. So these are the um, emotional struggles that steal my motivation. They keep me still uncreative, uninspired, and disconnected. They make me feel enormously distant from that kid that I described earlier who could simply sit down and make art, finding joy in the process regardless of the outcome. And these struggles, they affect more than my creative process. They flow into every aspect of my life, including my faith and my relationships. And unless I intentionally push back on these struggles, my mind and my heart will drift to places that I don't wanna go. To borrow an analogy, you know, speaking of drifting, to borrow an analogy that I heard several years ago from Jason Jaggard. Um, he's the CEO of a coaching agency called Novus Global. And Jason was speaking at a creative, creative conference that I was attending. And he likened that emotional undercurrent to everyone's favorite water park amusement ride, the Lazy River. 
The lazy river has this flow of water moving through it with a bunch of tiny unseen jets that are beneath the surface of the water. And those jets move us down the river while largely going unnoticed. You don't see the jets, but they're there pushing us in one direction, whether we want to go that way or not. And when I had heard Jason's lazy river analogy, I could certainly identify with that feeling of drifting and being gently pushed toward a life that I didn't want for myself or those around me. And it's hard to keep momentum and motivation going in the sort of unending, subversive flow of things like anxiety or apathy. And Jason Jaggard went on to say that many of us try and fight against the lazy river by trying to swim harder and do more, but perhaps we should be asking ourselves, how do we change the jets? And that was a huge moment for me as I thought about my own struggles and motives And I started asking, what are those jets that affect my personal and creative life? And I think the point that Jason Jaggard makes is that the jets are essentially the stories that uh, we think define us and what we believe about ourselves. Those stories and beliefs, they, they tell ourselves, you know, they either move us forward or they hold us back. And not long after that creative conference, I came across a few Bible verses where Jesus gets right to the heart of the matter and reveals two very different approaches and their results. So from Matthew chapter 6, 22 through 23, uh, this is from the message version. If you open your eyes wide in wonder and belief, your body fills up with light. If you live squinty-eyed in greed and distrust, your body is a musty cellar. And these words speak to me on many levels. As an, as an artist and visual communicator, I love that Jesus emphasizes and references our eyes in this verse. How I choose to view life and my place in it determines much. I certainly want to live and create in a state of wonder and belief filled with light, but this verse says the counter to wonder and belief is greed and distrust. And I soon realized after reading this verse that my own greed and distrust, they're major contributors that set me drifting. They're hard to spot, but greed and distrust, they're major forces that oppose creativity, joy, inspiration, and motivation. And if I go back to my list of struggles here, I can attribute all of them, anxiety, perfectionism, ambition, apathy, to either distrust or greed. And those struggles are really a personal narrative that says, don't rock the boat. You better think this through. Is this worth your time? Will they like what you make? It sounds like a lot of work. Maybe you better close your sketchbook and get comfortable. So it can be a challenge to self-examine and be honest with myself, but I've learned that when I'm feeling unmotivated, anxious, or stuck, my biggest weapon is to ask myself, where are the areas in my life that I'm being greedy or distrustful? Is the story that I'm telling myself moving me toward the light, or is it pulling me toward the darkness? And exposing those areas and identifying those, you know, to God and myself and giving up the scheming, twisting, or fear, it leads to peace. And I don't know about you, but I'm at my most creative and motivated when I'm at peace. So the choice between wonder and belief and greed and distrust, it's really just that. It's a choice. Both life experience and the Bible inform me that life is filled with hills and valleys. There have been and will be hard days. And referencing Bob Ross again for a moment, I know his actual life wasn't all blue skies. You know, I mentioned he was on the air through 1994. He passed away from cancer in 1995. And I'm not sure of the exact timeline there, but I know Bob Ross kept his illness from the general public. And I'm guessing there were days that he had to dig deep in order to continue on and show us all the joy of painting. I still struggle with anxiety, perfectionism, ambition, and apathy. It's a daily routine that I give those up through prayer. But it's from this place of peace that I find things like hope, inspiration, curiosity, belief, and wonder. And it's in this place that I'm able to re-engage my desire to make art, keeping the joy I find in the process at the forefront. So I'd like to share, I have a video demonstration uh, for you. It shows some of my art process and the way my struggles, they've influenced my process. Uh, But I've exposed those darker narratives that I tell myself and I've turned them in a new direction. So it's about eight minutes long.
opening my sketchbook and turning to the next blank page either excites me or scares me depending on how I feel in the moment. Some days I feel inspired and eager to make a new sketch. Other days I feel apprehensive, unsure, or timid and I struggle to move my pen across the page. The more concerned I am with making straight lines or creating a perfect drawing, the less fun I have when I'm sketching. As a rebellion to perfectionism and a nod to loosening my controlling grip, straight edges and precision have given way to searching and wondering lines as my pen explores the page. try not to be anxious or worried about the permanency of the marks that I make with ink and watercolor. Neither ink or watercolor can be erased or fixed. I can only move forward as I sketch. I try to let go of expectations as I draw without obsessing over what the end result will be. There's much that can be gained and expressed with a smaller and more intimate sketch. I typically work in sketchbooks and produce drawings and paintings that are brief, but they also point to the essence of what I find beautiful. Perhaps one day I'll attempt larger or more time intensive works, but my sketchbook method helps me avoid the struggles that come with being overly ambitious. And working in a sketchbook encourages me to stay dedicated to a daily sketching habit. Thank you.
staying committed to a sketching practice has sharpened my drawing skills and it's helped me find my voice as an artist. I aim to finish each sketch that I start and complete a full sketchbook before I start a new one. Even if I'm not pleased with the final result, I remind myself that I learn and grow by doing, not by speculating. Rather than the finished sketch, the time I've been given and the quiet moments of making art have become the blessing and the gift. Letting go of perfection by staying loose. Giving up expectations and always moving forward. Laying down ambition by embracing the humble scale of my sketchbook. Creating momentum by finishing what I start. Embracing the time that I've been given to make my art. This is how I sketch inspired. Thanks for watching. So I'm not exactly sure what the next few chapters look like regarding my artwork or career. I'm learning to work within the unknown and take more risks that are rooted in wonder and belief. And I've discovered during the process of re-engaging with my personal art that I have the opportunity to interact with and encourage fellow artists and sketchers. And I find joy you know, cheering others on as they make their art and I share what I've learned, uh, both from a sketching standpoint, uh, but also an artist mindset. Um, and I've learned much by engaging with other artists as they share graciously with me their own challenges and successes. So the opportunity to blend art, community, faith, relationships, and teaching is something I'm really excited about. And I'll leave you with a few final thoughts here. My signature mark, uh, my, my brand mark, but it's also my signature, it's meant to represent light or a sunrise or a sunset. And it's a reminder to me that each new day presents me with an opportunity to open my eyes, let in the light, choose wonder and belief. And the end of each day is an opportunity to embrace God's grace and let go of greed and distrust as I look forward to the next sunrise. And I think everyone in this room can recognize that greed and distrust, they're on full display as we look around at the current state of the world that we live in. Each new day presents all of us with an opportunity to choose light. The people around you, you know, creatives in this room, the people around you, they need to see your creativity, pardon me, your creativity. They need to see the beauty that you see. They need to see the light. Uh, so I want to challenge and encourage you and myself to continue on and find and highlight the beauty that surrounds us. Look for the joy as you create. Personally connect with your inspiration. And as you embrace joy and inspiration, you'll be encouraged. And in turn, you will encourage and be a blessing to those around you. Thanks for your time. Thank you, sir. Um, can we take a couple questions? 
Are you yeah. okay with that? Yeah. Do you, so. Does anyone have any questions they'd like to ask? There's an eager one right there in the back. Yeah. Yes. To do a drawing? Um, it's usually pretty brief, uh, under an hour, generally. Um, sometimes, I mean, there are a few back here that you know, would take, take a little more time than that, but definitely under two hours, yeah, for sure. If you're out in the open you know, and you're sketching live outside, um, it's really difficult to, you know, just the elements and, you know, the sun changes and things like that. You know, being brief like this, it's also helped me with plain air and being outside. Um, yeah, so I try and keep it brief. I know we have a small group. Go ahead, Jim. Yeah, I think it's, sure, I think it's more in a sense of peace, and I'm just grateful you know, to have the time to sit down and kind of put everything away and just appreciate that time for what it is. It's almost meditative. Um, I don't, I can't say that I pray, you know, during those moments, you know, but I do feel, I think, presence and just a lot of peace for sure. Yeah, it just helps me feel creative, you know. Yeah, good question. Uh, Probably Italy. I mean, we haven't been back there since, but we hope to go back to Europe um, next year. And I think just being someplace that was so different, you know, I, it was like a storybook. I mean, it really was. And just what I was interested in as a kid and those prints that I talked about that hung in my grandmother's uh, living room for all those years, just getting to see that and experience that, it really was amazing. I mean, the context it's hard to fathom some of these buildings literally being thousands of years old, you know? And in Ohio, we don't quite get that. <laughs> I still love Ohio, but Italy was, was amazing. Venice in particular, uh, yeah. Yeah, sure, right, it does affect, I think they both feed into each other uh, for sure. Um, I'm always amazed at what I discover just in the elemental, like the fundamental parts of sketching, composition, light, and color. They absolutely translate to the digital renderings and the more complex you know, and detailed renderings, and then vice versa. I learned so much about architecture in particular, but also uh, renderings. I could see when I was young, um, young being in my 20s, when architects would look at the drawings that I made, you know, and they, they would critique them, you know, for sure. But when I saw them light up, you know, I could figure out why, what did they like about what I just did? You know, and then I would build on that. And those, you know, composition in particular, I think is really important um, with sketching. And I always keep that in mind. You know, I always try and put something either dead center in the page and like the clock, you know, just focus on the clock. And I think, years ago, I would have been tempted to do the entire street scene. You know, not just the clock, but everything. And I would get lost in that and frustrated because I was trying to do too much. And composition and learning composition, it's helped me narrow my focus to a point where I can really be strategic and it brings me a lot of joy because it takes the pressure off. I'm just gonna draw the clock, not the entire street. You know, that kind of thing. Yeah. Right. Is there a way to like, if you ever suck, to kind of branch out and create more style? Like, like I see architecture done by pre visual artists, pre visual minimalists, mm -hmm. like that. If you ever suck to do something more equally but still commercial or maybe stylized? Sure. I've dabbled in that a bit. Um, but I think where I'm at at this point is I like the extremes. You know, I like the sketch stuff that you see back here. And, and my fine art, and then the commercial side, I like the opposite extreme, and I like to keep them separate. And I'm to the point now where if someone requests me to do a rendering in a hand style, um, I'll try and gently nudge them back to photorealistic um, because I want to keep them separate. I like them in their compartments. I don't know if that's healthy or not. We'll, we'll see. <laughs>
Any others? I have two questions. Yeah. Are you open to sharing what you're working on right now on the side? With, uh, with in terms of the teaching? Yes. Stuff? Sure. Yeah. Okay. So share what you're doing right now. What your, okay. what, what your other project is. All right. So Sketch Inspired, that name. Yeah, there's more to it than just this talk. I have a website, uh, sketchinspired.com. And I'm, I sort of find myself, as I've gained a following on Instagram, uh, almost like a sketching apologist. <laughs> and uh, doing things by hand, you know, analog, um, there's a beauty to that, that it's almost like a musician playing an instrument. You know, there's something there that I personally feel like I don't think machines will ever truly replicate. And honestly, I hope they don't. And I love doing this stuff by hand. So I have a website, sketchinspired.com. And through that, I hope to teach more, um, generally online classes, but also in person. Uh, you know, we just did that sketch crawl last month, and I've done some workshops in other contexts, and I, I enjoy doing that. I enjoy teaching. Uh, so Sketch Inspired essentially has become a brand that I've built uh, that I hope to teach and use that as a vehicle to, to connect with people. You're being humble. You, Paul's been working on this for a long time. Um, he's put a lot of time into this. And so at some point in time, you'll be able to sign up on the website yeah. um, and get access to all of his training videos, um, which is just going to be awesome for him. I'm super excited for him. So, um, and I know you don't like talking about yourself. Go to his website if you're interested. Put your email address in there, and he'll let you know. But um, when it's all ready to go, you'll be able to just log in and have access to all of his videos. He's going to teach you. Uh, his process and what he's learned and it should be really really cool and I have one other question for you so like what SPF do you wear um, <laughs> like, if you're sitting in the Sun for an hour yeah. I mean I can really so my wife and I've had conversations about this because and my daughter they're my style gurus okay and I need to wear a hat but if I wear a ball cap it I don't like it because I can't see up okay right? my kids just make fun of me for wearing a hat okay so, so I I'm I've worn a beanie outside a couple times. Okay. And I feel my mom is really laughing. Does it have a propeller on the top? It does not. Okay. No. It's a slouchy beanie, but okay. I'm not a beanie type guy. So we're trying to figure this out. Okay. But I definitely, being outside, it's it's a thing. Okay. So I, I'll figure it out as I go. All right. Yeah. yeah. Beanies. Yeah. Who knew? Yeah. Well, thanks so much for coming out this evening. Uh, Paul's going to stick around a little bit. Feel free to ask him any questions you have. Uh, check out his prints that he has in the back. He does have those for sale. Check them out. Uh, and thank you for coming. Appreciate it.